have a wall, should just be a countertop all the way back. Countertop all the way back. This video is sponsored by Narwhal. Everybody. Welcome back to the house. As you can see, we've started in on the painting, and if we come around this corner, I can show you what I'm working on. If you've been following this series, you know that we gained all this space because we took out a chimney that was right here that used to run the furnace. Now we've moved the furnace into the attic. We've also added a pocket door and saved a ton of space. Now I get to build the cabinets that are gonna utilize that space. The plan from the beginning has been to have like an appliance garage in here, as well as a bit of dry food storage and some storage for sheet pans above. So it's gonna be a wraparound cabinet. The refrigerator will go here. It's a counter depth fridge, so it's not gonna take up a ton of space and it should look like a nicely integrated built-in unit. I've made a lot of measurements on the walls. I know what I need to build. So let's go back to the shop and start gluing things up. So the kitchen cabinets actually got started a couple months back and you may know that I put out a video on making all of the basic carcasses for the entire kitchen. Now it made sense to make all of those at once because it was the same operation and it just makes things more efficient. The downside of making all the carcasses at once is that we don't have space to store them. So I left them unglued so I could break down a couple of them and then uh, glue them later, glue them as I was building them. Now, weirdly, these two didn't get disassembled so I had to disassemble them first before I could glue all the parts together and get them ready for the rest of the bits that I'm gonna be adding in this video. There are two carcasses that make up the fridge surround and this one is gonna go above the fridge. And it's really important that I make sure that this is perfectly square because otherwise it won't fit into the framing, the doors won't line up and we'll have all sorts of problems down the road. Speaking of the doors, you may have noticed this raw front edge on the front of the cabinet. I left it like that because I wanted to trim a piece to fit. This is gonna be the bumper that the doors close into. I want it to look good, but I also want it to add strength to the cabinet. So I cut in this little rabbit. This is going to wrap around that front edge of plywood. Not only will it look better, but it's also gonna make sure that the cabinet doesn't sag if there's a whole bunch of weight in it. Moving on to the second cabinet. This is the cabinet that's replacing the chimney and it's amazing how much space we're gonna get inside of this cabinet. I also decided with it disassembled to rip this front edge off that I glued on before because I liked that continuous wide piece that I added on to the upper cabinet. With that minor alteration, I can start gluing this cabinet up in the same way that I glued the other one. This one is a lot bigger, however, so I had to be quick about it to make sure the glue didn't set up before I was ready. Since these cabinets are built-ins, I need to think about how they're gonna be mounted to the wall, so I'm gonna make some cleats. I cut some pieces out of plywood and then used my pocket hole jig to make some pocket holes so I can screw them in. There's multiple benefits to building them this way. For one, it's gonna help square up the cabinet, but mostly it's gonna provide enough meat behind that quarter inch panel so that I can screw through it and into the wall. On the over fridge cabinet, I'm gonna be attaching a French cleat to this later on, so it'll be helpful for that as well. Okay, so both of the cabinets are glued up. They're nice and square, and I'm gonna turn my attention to the hardware. This one in particular gets a kind of complicated style of hardware, a type of hardware 
I've never used before. So where this goes in the house is where we remove the chimney. And if you remember, there's a doorway there and I don't want the cabinet doors to open up and completely block that doorway. So the solution that I've come up with is a pocket door and this is the hardware that I found. This is pocket door hardware. I've never installed it before, but it seems to be the right stuff to solve my problem. The idea is that it goes inside of the cabinet and allows the doors to slide in and out. And so you open it with the hinge and then slide it back on the pocket door hardware. So I got this hardware kit from my friends over at Rockler and I ordered the wrong size. So these are 16 inch. I'm gonna have to wait to get the 18 inch that I need. It's mostly because I hadn't really finished designing the cabinet when I ordered the hardware. But in the meantime, I can do a test to make sure that this stuff works. One thing that is really funky about this kit, and you may not know this if you order it, is that it doesn't come with hinges or clips. So you need to provide your own. The reason why I think they do that is because there are a whole bunch of different varieties of hinges that you can use with this. So if you want full overlay or partial overlay, you can choose which ones you want. But I went with the ones that I already had in my shop. I, I usually keep some of these on hand because I use them all the time. I popped them on, gave them a test, and they weren't working quite right. All right, real quick, let me show you what's going on. I'm not sure what's exactly wrong, but uh, this runner will not slide past this door. Oh, oh, yeah, but that's gonna scratch it up real bad. Um, yeah, I gotta figure that out. Spacing's off some somehow. The first thing that I did was attach it to a board so that I could work on it more easily. That definitely helped, but I could not for the life of me get it to run smoothly. I attached the hinges again and adjusted them all the way outward. And while I could get it to move, it definitely didn't move smooth. And one of the big problems was that it was scratching the crap out of the front of the door. My solution to this was to add in some of these spacer clips. Now this just adjusts the door outward. I was originally planning on having a full overlay door, but it didn't seem to be possible with the hardware that I was using. When I clipped in some spacer clips, these full overlay hinges basically turned into inset hinges and they worked fine. Well, I'm really glad that I made this mock-up because I now understand this hardware a lot better and I definitely didn't before. One of the things the instruction manual says is that you can use partial overlay hinges and when I use those hinges, they scrape up the front of this door and don't work. So I'm gonna be using inset hinges, which means that they will sit a little bit inside, but I can use a trim strip to cover up whatever exposed edge there is, and that just prevents this door from getting dinged up, which is really important. So uh, feeling good, this is much better. I think I can go with this solution and we can move on with the project. For lack of a better term, I'm gonna start calling this the chimney cabinet because it's what replaced the old chimney. The chimney cabinet needs to be divided in the upper cubby because I want it to align with the cabinet doors that are on the over fridge cabinet. And the middle section of it is gonna actually be a pull out pantry. So I made an extra panel that I can use some scrap plywood to set the correct height. The new panel slides in and sits on top of those scrap pieces of plywood while I screw it in from the outside. I'm not worried about exposed screws on the outside because at the end, this will all be covered up. Speaking of covering things up, that pocket door hardware is pretty ugly, so I'm gonna build a couple baffles. This is not only an aesthetic thing, it's also to prevent anything that's in the cabinets from interacting with the hardware and gumming up the works. It took me a little bit to figure out how I wanted to attach the baffles. The lower one is pretty easy because the 
upper section and lower section are gonna be covered up by drawer hardware, so I can just use pocket hole screws. The upper one, however, it's all gonna be exposed, so I think I just have to screw it in through the outside of the cabinet. For the spacing of the baffles, it was nice to have the mock-up here because I could measure directly off of the hinges that I'm gonna use and build spacers out of scrap plywood. With two spacers cut, I can place them inside the cabinet and then slide in the panel. The upper cubby, like I said, is the same as the bottom cubby, except for I'm screwing it in from the top and the bottom. Now, you will technically be able to see the screws underneath, but that area is actually going to be a pantry and you'd have to really be looking for them if you wanted to see them. I feel like this is the best solution I could come up with short of doing it in the initial glue up phase, which would have been really challenging. While I'm still waiting for the pocket door hardware to arrive, I decided to start gluing up the door panels. And for the chimney cabinet, I really wanted the doors to be continuous grain from top to bottom. So I'm using solid white oak here. I bought some 10 foot sticks from a local lumber yard and they're pretty darn good. They're S4S, which means they're sanded on four sides and they've been pre-milled but I always like to trim the glued up edge. And for that, you'll notice that I labeled them up and down. This is a technique to get a better joint when you're joining big boards together. The first run on one side will be facing up on the table saw, and then I will flip the opposing side over and cut that side. So if the table saw blade is even a 10th of a degree out of square, it will still marry up perfectly. I'm using a slower setting wood glue on this so I have enough time to work. I also am adding in these big panel clamps from Rockler that I love because they not only hold from side to side, they also hold from top down. So if you use calls in your glue ups, these function as both calls and clamps at the same time. I'll be honest, this was a pretty nerve wracking glue up. It's a lot of lumber. It needs to be perfectly straight along a long distance. And I took my time, made sure everything was aligned properly, checking things with a straight edge. And in the end, I was very happy with the results. Since this panel is continuous grain, I need to make sure I make the cuts in exactly the right spot. So I wrote down the measurements and started cutting. It made the most sense to me to start kind of in the middle so that this panel, which is incredibly heavy, was more manageable. For the rest of the cuts, I do those on the table saw with the cross cut sled. I also recut the cut that I made on the track saw to make sure that everything's square to each other. I ended up with a little bit extra, so the nice thing about that is I can use the last little bit of that panel to have a continuous grained toe kick, which I think is pretty cool. I've had a lot of folks ask where Ashley and I have been living during construction. We've always lived above the shop in a space that I built in 2015. It's interesting to compare the new kitchen to the old one and see how far I've come as a maker. The old fridge surround works well, but the new one is without a doubt a better design. 
While I've been building the kitchen, I've also been keeping my eye out for some interesting new home tech. So when the nice people at Narwhal reached out this week, I was really excited. They wanted me to test out the new Freo X Ultra, a robotic mopping vacuum cleaner that boasts to have exceptional cleaning power and minimal maintenance. They offered to sponsor this video in exchange for an objective review. So here we go. With a cat and a dog in the house, cleaning up fur is a daily chore. Having an automated robot vac is so exciting, and it seems like Narwhal designed this with pet owners in mind. They designed the world's first zero-tangling aerodynamic floating brush. The brush is supported at one end and tapered so the hair rolls right off of it rather than binding up. It also has mops that only lower from the base when needed. These Rouleau Triangle Scrubbing Mops are a really clever design that leaves no gaps while cleaning, making it more efficient. The all-in-one station is just as impressive as the vac with automatic water exchanger, detergent dispenser. It cleans and dries the mop heads for you, which is totally insane. When deployed using the app, the Freo X Ultra scans your home and automatically detects flooring types and delineates rooms. I was also surprised with how quiet the narwhal is, so much so that the animals were more curious about it than scared. While being that quiet, it still has an impressive 8200 Pascal suction power so that when I threw some cereal at it, the narwhal ate it all with no problem. While doing the tile floor in the kitchen, I discovered that it re-mops the floor until it's clean thanks to its dirt sense technology. Ours took six rounds, which is genuinely embarrassing, but the floors look great. The Freo X Ultra by Narwhal is packed with cool features and I can't wait to use it in the new house. If you're interested in adding the Narwhal to your home, check out the link in the description or search Google or Amazon for Narwhal Freo X Ultra. Thanks Narwhal, now back to the build. Hardware's here. Perfect timing. I was starting to run out of things to do without the right size hardware in my shop, so I was really happy that it showed up. It's way easier to install this stuff a second time. The first time I saw this hardware, I had no clue how it worked. So I'm really happy again that I built that mock-up. I built two of these, one long, one short, and both of them had a chunk of solid white oak in the center. With those taller clips installed in the pocket door hardware, I could start drilling out the door panels for the hinge hardware. I really like this drill guide for uh, drilling out the hinges. I'll post a link to it down below. But one thing that I don't usually use it for, I guess it has holes to drill out for the, the screws as well, but I always just use my combination square and it's always worked well for me. I got a little ahead of myself installing the baffles before I had the hardware, so now I have to remove them, but fortunately they're just held in with screws. I can then slide in the assembly that I just put together and hold it into place with a long reach clamp. I adjust the front edge of the tracks so that they're in the right location and screw them into place. I can then click in the door and test to see if the assembly works. Fortunately, the upper door went in smoothly and it did not scratch the face of those new cabinet fronts, so that made me really happy. The bottom cabinet was a rinse and repeat and it went in smoothly. I was feeling pretty old hat at this point <laughs> installing this hardware. Fair warning, the next shot has a bit of a spoiler for the next video. I meant to hide <laughs> these uh, drawers, so ignore them if you don't want a spoiler. Uh, sorry, too late. Uh, they were super fun to build. In the next video, I'm going to go into all the organizers, the drawers. They're all made out of solid wood, and I used everything from the lathe to uh, some fancy joinery. So stay tuned for that. For now, just check out how cool this mini pantry is. And this is what I'm going to attach the, the drawer front to. So you kind of have to see that anyway. 
Okay, so the drawers are installed and they're looking great. Uh, one thing that I'm running into is that I can't really do much more until I have this installed in the house. And the reason for that is because there's a little bit of wobble in it and I can't square up this panel without knowing that it's installed plumb in the house. So I'm gonna disassemble everything that I've done here and then bring this into the house, install it there, and then we can finish off the rest of the details. Back in the house, I can start installing the cleats to hang the cabinets off of. And when I built this space, I designed it with a little bit of extra room in the back so I can shim everything out. It's usually a good idea to give yourself a little extra room in the areas where people can't see things. Drywall, if reliable for anything, it's reliable for never ever being flat. And this wall is no exception. It's a brand new wall, brand new drywall. I swear we shimmed out the drywall and yet this corner had about 3 sixteenths worth of a gap. So I shimmed that out, pulled it forward, checked it with my straight edge, and once it was flat, I could attach it back to the wall again. Now I have a good foundation to build off of and I can shim the rest of the wall out with another board. As I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna be hanging the over the fridge cabinet with a French cleat. The chimney cabinet doesn't need to hang because it sits squarely on the floor. So I'll just use that side to screw into and I won't put a cleat on the back of the chimney cabinet. The levelness of this cleat is gonna determine the levelness of the cabinet. So while I'm screwing it in, I pop a level on top of it and work from the center out and check both sides, making sure that the cleat stays level. I need to match the cleat on top with a cleat on the bottom so that the cabinet doesn't kick inward. So I just match the same number of panels down below and screw them into the wall. I also attached a third lower cleat to catch the bottom of the chimney cabinet. Back in the shop, the French cleat goes on and then we are ready to install it in the house. I called my buddy Josh to see if he'd come by and help me hang the cabinets. Before we can permanently attach the chimney cabinet, I slid in a panel of MDF. This is going to cover up the side of the cabinet. We're gonna be able to paint it out really easily and it'll make it wide enough for the doors to have a spot to close. The only thing is that once again, the drywall is not flat. So I'm gonna scribe this to the wall. With the chimney cabinet plumb and the MDF clamped, I strike a line and then I can remove it and bring it back to my shop to cut it with the track saw. When the MDF goes back in, it's guaranteed to be perfectly flush to the surface of the cabinet. And now I can permanently attach everything, making sure that things are rock solid. I screw in between the two different cabinets. I also attach that MDF with several screws, just making sure that it doesn't bow out when I go to paint it. Now I know that you're never gonna see the inside of this because there will always be a fridge in front of it, but I couldn't help myself. I already had this spackle out from drywalling the house. So I figured I'd fill in the holes, sand them down, and then I could paint it. With the paint dry, I can add in a strip of hardwood edge banding to cover up the seams. I personally think that these wider edged panels look a lot better. They look a little more substantial and it matches the edge banding that I added to the over fridge cabinet that I installed before. 
To cover up the gap in the crown of the cabinet, I cut a piece of scrap wood and then strategically placed some pocket holes. These are gonna match the ceiling joists so I have something to bear into. I got the right hand side of this piece of plywood to line up really well, but the left hand side kept dipping inward. So in order to fix that, I just screwed in a screw on that front corner. You're never gonna see the surface of this panel, so I can use that screw to pry this front corner out. So speaking of covering up that top panel, now I can trim out the rest of the cabinet and make it look integrated into the space. Now once again, drywall is never flat and the top edge has a gap, so I'm going to have to scribe this board. I measure the widest spot that it sticks out, which was at the base, and then I use a spacer that's the same width to draw my scribe line. I trace it along the entire length of the board, and then I can bring it back to my shop to cut it. But sometimes when you're scribing to a wall, it'll be really wobbly and you'll have to use a jigsaw to cut it out. But whenever I can get away with it, I like to use the track saw because it leaves a nice straight line. This wasn't so extreme that I needed a jigsaw, so the track saw was perfect. I added a chamfer to the outside edge to make it look a little bit more finished, and then it was ready to install in the house. After scribing, that gap is completely gone and it's flush to the inside of the cabinet. I nailed the trim piece on and then I could move over to the left hand side where I cut a wider strip. This doesn't need to be scribed, obviously. I'm letting it overhang a little bit because I'm gonna tile up to it, but we'll save that for another video. To finish off the surround, I made a crown piece, which I scribed to the ceiling and got a really nice tight fit. I also added a chamfer to the bottom edge and the two sides so that it had a nice shadow line between the elements. Then I could apply a coat of finish after taping off all the edges. And this is Rubio Monocoat 5% Mist. We'll talk about it more when we go to apply it to the doors. After I had assembled the carcass, I did a dry fit of the doors and I'll be honest, they were looking a little bit plain and what's the point of having solid wood doors if you don't add a bit of depth to them? One of the design themes that I've carried throughout the house, which is inspired by our coved ceilings, are curves. I've been adding a lot of curves into this house. It's sort of a nod to the art deco roots of this house. It's from 1940, but 1939 is sort of the end of the art deco era. And I love that look, but I don't want an old house. I want kind of a new house that has nods to its old roots. So I decided to grab one of these cove cutting bits and cut some flutes into the front edge of the cabinet. We are potentially adding fluted glass to some of the other elements in the kitchen. So this is gonna tie into that theme as well. The other element that's missing from the doors is obviously the door pulls. And since it's solid wood, once again, I have the depth that I can do finger pulls that are integrated into the wood. And it just so happens that I was checking out the Shaper Origin website and I saw that they just came out with a finger pull bit, which is perfect timing. So thanks to my Shaper friends who sent me out a bit. Shaper Origin is a handheld CNC machine. It controls the bit and all you have to do is sort of guide it along. It's not self-propelled, but it is self-correcting. I have a whole video on Shaper Origin if you want to check that out. It has a lot of capabilities and I cover a bunch of them in that video if you want to learn more about the tool. Each of these pulls requires three passes. Two passes with a rough cutting bit to remove the bulk of the material and a third pass with the finger pull bit to get the undercut that I need. 
The most efficient way I could figure out how to cut this with the Shaper Origin was to put tape on every single panel and make workspaces for each individual panel and then cut all the roughing cuts first. Then I could go and swap the bits out. This way I'm only swapping the bits out once. And in theory, I'm less likely to mess up the cut because I only have to change the settings on the tool once. Unless, of course, I mess up the settings the first time. Z-touch on the tool failed, so it registered the old bit, not the new bit, which means that the, the depth was wrong, which means that this panel is messed up. Um, I can glue another strip on here to fix it, but I need, to, I need to carry on and finish off the rest of these. A Z-touch is where you touch down the bit so that the machine knows how deep it is so that it can get really precise measurements. Now, I must have missed an error message that came up. So on my second go, I re-Z-touched it. I double-checked. I got down on my knees to check to make sure the cut was working before I finished it off. And this time, it worked fine. I then went back to the piece that I messed up and cut off the edge with the handle on it. I milled another piece to replace it, glued it on, and clamped it up. After a couple hours, I removed it from the clamps, sanded it down, and trimmed it to the right size. I left the shaper tape on it the entire time, so I didn't even need to build a new workspace or set up anything different. Everything was already set up, I just cut it right this time. The results had a few burnt edges, but they were way better than the first go, so I took that as a win, and I can do the rest with hand sanding. Speaking of which, when I have a shape like this that I need to sand, I usually like to t make a template so that I can sand the flat area and get as far into that cove as possible. My little sanding jig worked great for the flat areas, but when it came to the finger pulls, that uh, didn't work for it. I had to roll up a piece of sandpaper and just kind of work my way around. The long grain was easy, but the end grain definitely took a while. Before applying finish, I decided to put chamfers on all the edges of the panels. This is going to give it a much more finished look. It's also better to prevent tear out. I just have to be really cautious that I avoid those finger pulls that I just added in. Now once again, I'm using Rubio Monocoat 5% Mist for the entire kitchen. And the reason I chose this color is that it's a little bit of a stain that's gonna prevent the yellowing that you get with kind of a natural finish. And uh, it also kind of looks like raw wood. It's, it's about as close as you can get to the raw color of white oak, which I really like. Rubio is a two part hard wax oil mix and really the hard wax oil is the first part and the second part is just a catalyst to speed up the drying time. I mix it together and then I squeegee it onto the flat sections and then burnish it into the rounded sections using a scotch Brite pad. Rubio chemically bonds to the pores of the wood so I have to make sure that the wood is incredibly clean and well sanded, but you don't wanna sand it up to too high of a grit. I think their limit is 180 grit before it stops bonding. After you let it sit for about five, 10 minutes, you wanna wipe it down completely, getting rid of any and all residue. Even though it's called monocoat, I always put at least two coats on because I find that it has a better sheen. Back in the house, I could finally test out these doors, see how they fit, and I'm so excited about this. I've had this design in my head for months, and it's so cool to see it come together. 
I temporarily attached the toe kick with some double stick tape. This is just to see how it looks, but I will remove this before we tile the floor and then it will go on top of that tile. For the most part, it's really easy to install these doors, except for the center one, which is gonna be the pantry. This one takes a little bit of doing because it has a, a fully enclosed door front. So I added in four screws before the door front went on, and those I let poke out a little bit so that I can mark the cabinet. I then put spacers underneath the cabinet door and press it into place. Those screws leave indentations on the back and then I can take it down to the floor, pre-drill them and connect them. With that, the cabinet face is done and it's time for the big reveal. So the first piece of actual cabinetry is in the kitchen. That is a big deal. And this is one of the biggest pieces of cabinetry that's gonna go into the kitchen. So it's a big hurdle. I'm really happy that it worked. There's several pieces of hardware that I never used before and even using hardware in a very different way than I have before. So it's, it's nice to have a proof of concept. Obviously there's, there's more elements. The fridge isn't in. We've got drawers and organizers that are gonna go in and I'm gonna cover that on the next video. If you guys are interested in plans for this, I genuinely don't know if this is something people would be interested in. Let me know in the comments down below because if you are, we'll do a pre-sale in the next video and we'll get you guys a set of plans. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you to Narwhal for sponsoring this video. Thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you on the next one.